We're back with another episode of the Room for Nuance podcast. I'm Sean DeMars. I'm joined with two guests. This is the first time on Room for Nuance we've had two guests at the same time. Wow, what hey. a privilege this is for you. Can you tell mm. us your names? Yeah, I'm Luke Womack, uh, founder and president of Arrow. Yep, and I'm Matt Sankey, and I'm the executive director at Arrow. And what is Arrow? Yep. Well, let's pray. And I'll ask one of you to pray and then we'll jump in and you'll tell us all about yourselves. Let's do it. Uh, God, we thank you so much for today. Uh, We're just grateful for this podcast, for Room for Nuance podcast. And yeah, we pray that you do much with it, uh, that you'd help people to um, explore and dive into topics that are worthy of much more than a five or 10 minute conversation Mm -hmm. uh, that need more dialogue and that encourage people uh, toward Christ and toward the gospel. And we pray that to that end, we'd be able to serve uh, any listeners of this podcast today. Amen. 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 Why don't you start with the vision and then I'll get yeah. some mechanics. Yeah. Yeah. So our vision at Arrow is to end missions. Mm. And is that possible? It is. Okay. With God. So we have a little <laughs> asterisk on our vision statement. It says okay. to end missions asterisk and, and basically talks about how, man, like we won't finish missions. God will, according to his own timing. Mm-hmm. And we just have a role to play in it. But for a missions organization, that's a really odd sounding vision statement, right? It's like a, I don't know, a sales organization that says to end sales, yeah. right? It's like, it, it almost doesn't make sense until, until you understand what it means. So for us, missions was never the goal. And for the church, missions was never the goal. The goal is worship, right? And the way to get to that end of worship is actually not to stop doing missions, but to keep doing it until one day missions is no more because Christ has returned. Cause mm-hmm. in heaven, there is no missions. It's only worship. And so to end missions effectively means let's do everything that God has given us, use everything in our hands to do missions so that one day the means missions will be done. And the end worship is the only thing that remains. And so for us, we have a couple ways that we, we help uh, on the missions end, we basically want to get rid of barriers that are preventing healthy biblical expressions of missions from happening. And uh, so maybe I'll let Matt speak to both of those. Yeah. Yeah. We've got two programs. We got the GoFunds and we've been doing that for about eight years. Uh, we partnered with, I think it's 133 at this point, missionaries going to the unreached. We've taken on their student debt. So it's about six and a half million in student debt that we've assumed and we make monthly payments for them while they're on the field. Mm. After about 10 years, their loans are paid off. Uh, we've we paid off a few of our missionaries loans, but we've only been in existence for about a year. So, well, okay. So let's talk about that. Yeah. Would, are you, would you say that that debt is one of the biggest hindrances to missionaries going to the field? It totally is. Yeah. 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 Over and over again, we see college grads coming to us. They're young, they're aspiring, they're in faithful members of their church. They're excited to go, but there's just this one thing that's holding them up and it's student debt. Mm. So they went to college and they thought they were going to have a career in the U S forever formative time. You know, they get discipled in college in a church and then they get like eyes for the nations, Yeah. but now they got debt and they're not going to have the same kind of pay that they had, you know, if they're going to be doing a career in the U S so it really is a big barrier for them. So you just take it on, you take on their debt Mm -hmm. and you pay it off. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, what, have you received any pushback on that? Are you kidding? <laughs> uh, right. A lot. T- tell me what steel man, your case, what, what is the, the most significant pushback that you've heard for this idea or against this idea? Just, it's a really bad idea. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I, let me, let, let me, let me rewind a little bit okay. and, and offer some context. So mm-hmm. man, I, I was in college and God transformed my heart yeah. and really for the first time, helped me understand that missions is not for missionaries, but missions is for every believer in every age and every stage. And that meant me, even if I didn't go overseas. And that was a complete paradigm shift. So I I would say in that stage, I experienced both the sense of duty and the sense of delight. Like I have to do this. And that is true for a Christian, by the way. They have to do missions. If you're a follower of Christ, missions is for you. The Great Commission, yeah. The Great Commission, mission. missions, that is your mission. But also, on the other hand, you get to do it. Mm-hmm. Like Paul speaks to that. He calls it his ambition mm-hmm. in Romans 15, 20. That's nuts. Like his ambition to take the gospel to places where it's never been before. And so I felt that. I felt both of those, I think, for the first time. And I have this degree in business. I'm like, what do I do? 
do with this? Like, how do, how do all these things reconcile um, in a way that's the most honoring to the Lord? And so, honestly, it wasn't like some great idea. Really, it's not that good of an idea in many ways. It's not that novel or innovative. But I just started calling my peers in pure desperation to do something with my life that counted. You know, having read a bunch of people that influenced me, you know, David Platt and John Piper and Jeff Lewis being in his class and having Brian Zuni disciple me in college. It's like I was given so much. I just I was ready to do something. Blank check, Lord, what do you want? And so I called about 100 of my peers, maybe uh, a year, year and a half after graduating college. And literally, this is my opener. Number one, I said, have you ever considered a career in long-term missions to the unreached? People are like, I'm sorry, who is this? I'm like, we were in class together. Just answer the question. And so, man, a, a lot of people said yes. Uh, we went to a, a college that was, you know, fairly great commission focus. And the second question I asked of those people who said yes, like I've thought about being a missionary. The second question I asked is why are you not there right now? And I kid you not, every single person had the same answer. Student debt, student mm, debt, mm, student debt. Mm -hmm. I'm like, all right, Lord. So you're telling me we're going to take the the two least sexy things like, like raising money for missions and uh, raising money for student debt and mash them together and try to help get missionaries overseas. And that's exactly what we did. So there's obviously more to that story, but to answer your question right around that time, the main pushback I would say is you're going to get taken advantage of. Mm. Like people are going to say, oh, really? You're paying off student debt? Well, I got a bundle of student debt. Why didn't you pay off my student debt? Well, people do that with the military. I was in the army, 100%. you know, join the army. Uncle Sam will pay down your debt, blah, right. blah, blah. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. So, and we heard that. We're like, yeah, that's totally a risk. But what we did to mitigate the risk of getting taken advantage of uh, was number one, we decided we're not going to pay the student debt up front. So if someone has 50,000 in student debt, which by the way is about our average. So for a couple, for a, a family unit, about $50,000 of student debt is average. Okay. And so instead of writing a check for $50,000, what we do is we pay monthly across about 10 years. And so the benefit is four to $500 per month. Mm -hmm. And so that really insulates us against getting taken advantage of because yeah. You're telling me I get 500 bucks a month and have to move my family to the Middle East. And if I do that for a year, I get five grand. Yeah. Like the incentive is not there. Go rob a yeah. bank instead. Right. Like that, yeah. that would be like a better idea at, at that point. And yeah. so we, we don't think at this point that anyone's taken advantage of us. I would say the second thing that mitigates against that risk is having a rigorous vetting process, yeah, a 70 step process that. to make sure that the wrong people don't get through and that the right people do. Have you weeded out? people that you thought, oh, actually, I think they are trying to take advantage of us. Oh, I, I, I got one on this. You might have one too. Go ahead. I actually don't have yeah. an example in my mind Dude, I got that one. specific thing. Yeah. But. So the first year, we, we had no idea what we were doing. Yeah. We, we po I don't think I've ever told anyone this. We just put up a website, and at the time we had a different name, but we put up this website and uh, basically say, hey, we're paying student debt for missionaries. That was basically it, right? Like, click here. It was like a little cheap form. and. And uh, we got the first year, I think 200 applications and we had no money, mm. right? Like hadn't even done our first <laughs> event, 200 applications were like, yeah, joke's on you. So a ton of people applied and we did a fundraising event. We raised some money. We were able to approve three missionaries our first year. So humble beginnings, right? It's a, yeah. a, a good parable and a good one for us to remember even now. But I had someone apply that year who was actually going on a cruise ship for 12 months to 12 different like exotic locations and they were going to like share the gospel with people on the cruise ship. And while they were there, it was like going to Bali for a month. And I'm like, yeah, I think we need to probably <laughs> tighten this up a little bit. That was an easy paper cut. You're telling me they don't need the gospel. On the exactly. That's what they Come said. On. You know, <laughs> yeah. like, well, of course they do, but yeah. that's not what we do. Yeah. And so there were some, I don't think identity issues early on. We really knew what we wanted, but there were some marketing issues. We had to be really clear with the public about who we were looking for. Yeah. And once we did that, applications went way down mm -hmm. in a good way. And we started yeah. to get just a few applications, but the right people. Matt, you didn't have a story, but you seemed like you had something to say about that. Yeah, we got pushback from from donors most of the time. Yeah. So when we present this idea of taking on other people's debt, 
we'll get a lot of things like, oh man, like how could they make these mistakes to get in this debt? This isn't my debt. Why should I cover it for them? Mm -hmm. And we've had an interesting refrain for them, but we just, we just remind them like, Hey, can you think of someone who has taken on debt that they didn't, didn't get on their own? Like, can you think of anybody? And we're like, this is a gospel paradigm. It's perfect. Yeah. Like, think about it. Jesus took on the debt that you deserve, right? Yeah. He took it on. And so this is a great way for us to express that to these faithful believers who are looking to do something with their life that really matters. Yeah. It's just so ironic when, you know, you hear someone say like, yeah, I don't believe in paying for other people's debt. It's like, Come on now. Really? Come on now. Come yeah. on. Like I'm a slave, yeah. you know, like. And, and you just dead. assume that people are in debt because they've made poor decisions. And oftentimes yeah. they are, yeah. but not always. And Edwards actually has a great little thing on mm -hmm. helping people out with benevolence issues, even when they are the ones who made the stupid decisions. Mm -hmm. It's like, well, in the gospel, we are the ones who made the dumb decisions, mm -hmm. right? We Amen. freely chose uh, this sin debt and yet Jesus kindly pays it off for us. Amen. Yeah. Now he says it way better than I just yeah. did. But, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I think of, you, you showed a story of um, David and Emily. So our first missionary partners, like, cause, because people think like, oh, we're just paying a bunch of people student debt who are irresponsible and, you know, spending their student debt dollars on buying a car or something like that. But the, the story of this first one was a lot different. Yeah, I'll, I'll share. I mean, there's an issue in our culture for sure. The system yeah. is broken. So you've got high class people and their parents generally will pay for their education and it's fine. They, they get through school without debt. And then you've got the low, low income folks and the government helps quite a bit with debt. You get this huge gap in the middle of middle-class folks who can't get government aid, but they can't afford to pay, you know, cash flow their education. Mm -hmm. so you get this huge gap of people. So we have our first missionary partners, David and Emily, wonderful folks. I remember um, David was going to uh, Cal Baptist University to get a theology degree because he wanted to be a pastor. Okay. God changed his life and he decided, I want to plant a church among an unreached people group. Yeah. So a theology degree is a great thing to get because I need to translate scripture. Yeah. So he did that and they began to assume debt and his wife was doing kinesiology because she wanted to be able to help a tribe with basic, you know, healthcare sort yeah. of things. So great degrees for what they were going to do. And as they finish, they've got this mountain of debt, um, way more than they, they expected. They were working, I think it was like seven jobs, five jobs Job between the two of them throughout wow. college, just trying to knock down So they down weren't their being debt. lazy. No, oh, yeah. these are the hardest working people yeah. we know. Yeah, right. I mean, driven. They're, they're exceptional. But they had a lot of student debt. Yeah. <laughs> and so they go to their dream mission agency and they've got this, the hopes and aspirations and they finish their like orientation with this agency. And one of the last questions they get before they come back is, well, do you have any student debt? We need to do a credit check with you. <laughs> and they're like, oh my gosh, we didn't even know this was going to be a question. We yeah. figured we'd just raise money or something. And, and a note on that, like a lot of young people don't even think about it. Right. Yeah. Like student debt is just so commonplace that, you know, the 17 year old signs a promissory note, doesn't even look at the interest rate. And then when they're 25, they're like, oh, I have student debt. It's mm -hmm. like, yeah, you should have been paying on it for the last few years. That's an exaggeration and wasn't the case with David and Emily, but there seems to be a bit of an ignorance about like the responsibility that needs to kick in after you graduate and put that thing to death. We didn't see that quite as much with David and Emily or some of our other graduates, but it, it's not really top of mind for people that are mm -hmm. uh, leaving college. I would say. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what happened with them? So they got back from, you know, that discovery and the mission agency denied them, said, you've got to figure something out. Yeah. Like you're way over. Right, generally mission agencies have a cap of 20,000 okay. and that's household. Right. That's very, very low compared to what we've seen people walk out of school with. And so they've got, you know, way more than that. And they're like, well, I guess we're going to have to get jobs. And they were determined. They're like, it's going to take us 10 years to get overseas, but we're going to do it. We're going to get the highest paying jobs we can. We're going to work our tails off. We're not going to eat good food. We're not going to go to restaurants because we want to be overseas. And that's when Luke, you know, talked with them. You, you should share that story. Oh man. Yeah. So it, I think Matt painted it really well. Like this was a couple that was determined. Like they were dogged. We're going overseas, whatever it takes. This is what God is telling us to do. If, if God's going to tell us to go overseas, he's going to provide for all of our needs. And so in the, in the background, and <clears throat> we, we knew them from college, like we were peers with them. And I think they were a year, year ahead of me, but 
man, we heard about what they were doing, heard their story and we're building this thing in the background to pay student debt, but again, had no money, right? And so I sit down with David and Emily and our founding board member, and we look at them over lunch and say, listen, we know that you're trying to go overseas to Papua New Guinea, and we know that student debt is probably gonna prevent you from getting there for another 10 years. We would like to take on your student debt so you could go now. Mm. They look at us, they start crying, start saying thank you. They're just overwhelmed in the moment. And then they say, how much money do you guys have? And we're like, oh, we don't have any money. <laughs> and they're like, oh man, like wiping tears away. They're like, that's not as cool. Yeah, like, right. We know, but just like you, just like you have the faith that God's gonna get you there. Yeah. We have faith that if this is what God has for us, he is going to provide for this. Yeah. You know, given that we, we extend all possible effort to the end of raising the funds that we need. And, and sure enough, um, a couple months later, we hosted our first event and we had, I think, 190 donors. Sure, I, I should I should not say donors. We had 190 people show up, mm -hmm. and ask them to give. Put David and Emily on the stage and two other couples, and just said, "Hey, listen, everything is funded tonight. Like I had raised my salary, my salary is funded. Everything that's given this evening is going to pay student debt for these three families. And that night, donors gave ninety thousand bucks. Wow. So we're like, okay." That is God saying yes. Yeah. Because if God said no, this event would have been a flop. Mm. And to get like a seven to one, I think the event cost 12 grand, which to feed almost 200 people is really cheap. Yeah. And, and fed them dinner and everything. And so to get like a seven to one return on investment, the first event was, was one of the, the greatest affirmations from the Lord that we could have received that year, that this was something that he was behind. And that family proceeded to go to the field within, I think, six to eight months and stayed for almost a decade and we paid off their debt. So you've been doing this for that long. Yeah. Yeah. How old are you guys? I'm 35. Yeah. 34. Wow. And, and uh, did you start this together? Basically. So Matt and I knew each other in college. We were both, uh, he, he's one year, my senior, we were both in residence life. So we were both RAs and uh, yeah, Matt and I both always had a lot of ambition, but early on we could tell that we did things like literally opposite. Everything uh -huh. was done opposite. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. I eat fast. He eats slow. Uh, I'm all about systems and tasks. He's all about people and process. Like everything was opposite. And I think deep down that probably drove us crazy about each other, even yeah. though we had a lot of mutual respect. Yeah. But we were on staff together. I had a good friendship, good relationship Where? at Cal Baptist University. Okay. Gotcha. And so fast forward a few years, we both graduate. He's gone the marriage and family therapy route. I'm going the sales route. And ironically, neither of those would be the paths we'd ultimately pursue just for a couple of years. But then I start this thing and, you know, as a friend, he kind of knew about it, but Matt's probably eye rolling internally a little bit like, yeah, this is just Luke doing some weird thing over here on the side. The irony is it was one of those weird things on the side that God was actually behind. Mm. I'm not kidding. Like <laughs> Luke probably between the time he graduated and a year uh, later, he expressed 10 different business ideas that he had launched least. and started. He probably started this an is LLC. The one. This is the one. He was convinced. And so he came to me. This is the, uh, you know, I, I want to tell you about this idea. So he comes to our house. He's raising support. He meets with my wife and I. He's like, hey, I want to pay student debt for missionaries. I'm like, Luke, that is a really good idea. Yeah, no, he, he didn't say that. He really was smart. laughing. He and then, laughed and then I said, I cannot think of two harder things to try to raise money for. Yeah. than for like student debt and missionaries. Uh, and for that reason, I'm out. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. we didn't join him. And at, at the same time, I had a hundred over a hundred thousand in student debt. Yeah. Um, when he, when he talked to me and my wife. And so we're sitting there like, this is a great idea. We want to invest in things like this, but there's no way right now we can do it. And so we, this, that was one of the conversations that kind of in our mind, my wife and I, like, we've got to get out of this mountain of debt. And I was working at Cal Baptist university at the time. So I'm investing in these young people, trying to get them to the nations and they're in debt. We're all in debt. And I'm like thinking about the shackles that we're all carrying because yeah. of student debt. So my wife and I worked really hard. We got out in three years and then he took me to a Dodgers game. Did you do like the Dave Ramsey? Yeah, we, can we, we, can we talk about that? Yeah. $100,000 in debt, paid it off in three years. Incredible. And not not making like huge salaries. Yeah. He's working at a school. He's in Res Life. Yeah. 
yeah, I'm, we just budgeted. We didn't do extra stuff. Mm-hmm. We were really serious about it. Every extra dollar we had every month, we threw at our debt. And I just didn't want to be in shackles anymore. Yeah. So we went after it. And by God's grace, like it, he provided in ways we didn't expect. And it was awesome. But man, the freedom when you walk out of that, Oh, it was wonderful. Did you do the debt-free scream? No, we did not. <laughs> you don't have to call up to the radio show. You just do it in your bedroom. Uh, we definitely screamed. There were a lot yeah. of those. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think we had like a nice steak steak uh, dinner. Nice. So I don't know if you, you caught this, but Matt rejected me on my first fundraising. No, I for, caught that. For yeah, the organization sure. he'd be leading Okay, later. so then how did you come back around? That's right. So Luke knows me well. So he took me to a Dodgers game, which is my first love. Dude, who doesn't love football? Uh, so yeah, I, exactly. I, let me yeah. help you edit that. Your third love. Yeah, yeah. Cool. yeah my first love um, in order of yeah, yeah. your wife uh, falling in love. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so the Dodgers, then Jesus, okay. then my wife. Okay. okay. Uh, yeah, you know what I mean. So he took me to game and he invited me to join staff. He said, "Hey Matt, I know we met. You rejected me, but this thing's working, and I think you're the perfect guy to help me." He actually wrote my job description on a napkin at a restaurant after the game. I'm like, wow, this guy's really thought through this. What did I write? What was the title? Oh man. I think it was director of operations. Maybe. Yeah. Which you were and then promoted you to run the whole organization. So Mm -hmm. that worked out. Yeah. Okay. So you're paying off people's student loan debts. Uh, How long did it take you guys to really figure out what you were doing? We still don't know what we're doing. Roger that. We're we're figuring it out. I would say, I mean, a less tongue in cheek answer would be probably about four years, three to four years. So early on, like I mentioned, we had this nascent website that just said like, you know, free money. At least that's how people probably read it, which is not the intention, Mm -hmm. but that was stage one. And then after that, we got serious. We're like, oh, we really need to figure out who we want. And, and I would say in that season, in some ways we didn't know. So our, our three kind of main filters were you need to be going long-term, you need to be going through a local church and you need to, you need to be going to the unreached. Yeah. But even within that, we're like, how do we suss those things out well? Mm-hmm. And so there's a lot of people that helped us. I remember having conversations with uh, Brad Buser from Radius International, like the first year. And he was like, guys, you really got to tighten up uh, who you're going to accept. And and, and that was pivotal. Some of those early stage conversations helped us figure out uh, who to actually let through the doors. Yeah. Uh, but but I would say it still took us three to four years, and and Matt really built it. But he built our um, he built the GoFund, our, our um, student debt repayment program, and the application process. So it's seventy steps to this day. You know, step number one is apply online, and step number seventy is I think we start paying your student debt. So between those two steps, there's sixty eight other steps, <clears throat> and we have. Uh, in addition to Matt, we have a full-time team member who's dedicated to, to just that, and she has support on our, our team. But I, I would say it did take us yeah. four years. Out of out of a hundred people who apply, how many people make it all the way through? Yeah, that's a good question. So we've got like some preferred partnerships that we leverage Radius. now, things like that. Yep. Yeah. In the first year, it was 0.5 percent made yeah. it through because we had yeah, okay. so many poor quality applications. Yeah, right. So we've really clarified our our messaging so people don't apply unless they're fairly eligible. So I would say probably 15 to 20% um, of people who apply. And those are people who are, are legitimate applications. Yeah. So, but most of our people now come through partnerships that we have. Who are your partners? Um, yeah. So we're partnering with Radius. Um, we Love believe, them. yeah, we believe that training is the greatest tell yeah. to know that someone's going to make it long term. And so if they're willing to spend a year extra learning a new language and thinking about all these things, they're, they're a good investment for us. And so our attrition rate, I think is like 10% of our missionaries, which most mission agencies, I think the numbers are after two years, 50% of people come off the field. Oh yeah. That's super low. So super yeah, we're low. really grateful. And we think it's because of the partnerships we've leaned on. Yeah. Um, so ABWE is another one. Yeah. Par- partners like that have helped yeah. us to kind of focus who we're investing in nice. and those guys know us and they know who we would approve. And so we have conversations with them. Often. And, and for them, the approval rating is 100%. What, so, what do you mean? So we've effectively said to them, Hey, we know you, you know us, we trust you and your vetting is as strict or even stricter than ours. So there's no 
purpose of someone going through our primary channel to get approved for student debt repayment. So if you send someone to us, given these guidelines, we'll approve them 100% of the time, mm -hmm. given that we have funds. Mm -hmm. And so through that partnership, we've been able to approve quite a few people through Radius and ABW. I'd say roughly 40%, th yeah, 35, right. 40% of our total, you know, missionary caseload, so to speak, has come through our preferred partners. Do you guys also work with like uh, IMB missionaries and stuff like that? Yeah, we, there's, there's quite a few agencies that we've worked with. Um, some of the agencies we have to do a bit more vetting because we don't know the agency as well and we got to get to know the person and every, every agency does things differently. So it's been a lot of learning on our part, but we just want to make sure that, you know, donors are giving to this and they're expecting for these folks to do what we said they're going to do, which yeah. is to attempt to plant a church among an unreached people group. Yeah. So we take the stewardship really seriously. We want to make sure. Account. Yeah, we're investing in people that are, are worthwhile. Yeah. So there's quite a few agencies we worked with, um, and it's really the individuals that we're investing in. So yeah. we do quite a bit of vetting with those newer ones. What are the theological boundaries? I mean, uh, are you guys reformed? Did, does that make the cut? What's the issue there? Yeah, yeah. Personally, we're reformed. Uh, that isn't a uh, question in our vetting process for the GoFund. Uh, here's here's You're what out I hear funding Arminians. Wow. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> here's the thing. Uh, I'm a Southern Baptist. Um, I go to Southern Baptist Church. The IMB Southern Baptists are not going to finish the Great Commission. The church is going to finish the Great Commission. Amen. So we're looking for evangelical people who have a very clear gospel. They're able to articulate it. Yeah. And their methods of missions are historically biblical. Mm -hmm. um, they, so so you, what you mean by that is like rapid church planning movement stuff, probably not going to get behind that. Not interested. Yeah, yeah we would approve someone with an Arminian soteriology um, well before we would ever approve someone who has a CPM, DMM, DMM movement stuff, methodology yeah. perspective on, yeah. on reaching people. Yeah. In fact, we, we w wouldn't do it, do it before. We just wouldn't approve yeah. someone who has that, that yeah. methodology. Uh, egalitarian? You know, it hasn't really come up much. I think the, the veins of people that are coming through to yeah. us, uh, they're mostly complementarian. So yeah. we yeah. ask the questions. If we're concerned, we have questions about that, we'll ask. Um, but we're, yeah, biblical in the sense that we're expecting a, a, a male to be the pastor, mm -hmm. um, to be the, the primary missionary. Obviously, the wife is extremely important. If you look through missions history, I mean, women have played as much or bigger role mm. in missions than men have. And so, no. uh, but we want to be faithful to the Bible. So, And this is a, a tricky thing because, I mean, personally, we have convictions that are strong on you, what you call second or third tier issues. On the other hand, you have not a lot of people who are signing up to go take the gospel to unreached people groups. So on one hand, we don't want to lower the bar and just say, we'll take anyone. Absolutely not. Like we want to export our best and our brightest to the mission field. But on the other hand, if we raise the bar so high that nobody can hop over it, there's only no a 1689 reformed Baptist. Exactly. Right, yeah. It's like we have to figure out where to draw the line. And so we where have, do you draw the line? Great question. And we have to give an account for that also. Amen. So for us, we draw the line. Everything above the line is essentials, right? First year issues. You know, Jesus is the son of God, right? Uh, saved by grace through faith on the basis of Christ's righteousness alone. Like those are some of the basics. And we allow for diversity when it comes to second tier issues. Mm -hmm. And uh, depending on who you ask, this issue might be second tier or first tier or second tier or third tier. Mm -hmm. And so we, we have a list of those that we've created to make sure that everyone that we're approving uh, is aligned on the first tier issues. But we've so you have your own confessional standards that you use. I mean, you may not call it that, but basically yeah. we want to protect these doctrines and promote these doctrines. Correct. And yeah. we're slightly ecumenical by design. Because like Matt said, we don't think Baptists are going to finish the Great Commission. We hope they play a significant role in it, and they have historically, mm -hmm. yeah. and we hope will in the future. But there's other denominations uh, who will play a role in that sure. as well. Yeah. So you nailed it. Nice. So GoFund is one, which by the way, you're called Arrow. I, I've only ever known you as the GoFund. Yeah. Tell, tell me what happened. <laughs> yeah. So we started the go fund in 2014, which is a great name, by the way. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Arrow, it. not so much. No, I'm just, I'm just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> Tell us how you really feel. Yeah, yeah. Right. Tell us the truth. <laughs> so 
Yeah, we were just talking last night. Uh, my favorite definition of a friend is someone who says hard things to your face and great things behind your back. Hey, Amen. So thanks for being a friend to no us doubt, today. Brother. He's like, I don't like your name. <laughs> uh, so yeah, we started the GoFund 2014 and the GoFund was monoprogrammatic, right? We have one name and we do one thing. Okay. And, and I think honestly, that's a part of our ethos is we saw a lot of really well-meaning organizations at that time who were doing like 10 things. Yeah. And we're doing all of them poorly. Mm. And we're like, okay, you are older than us. You're uh, older in age as an organization. You're wiser than us collectively. You have more money and resources and connections than us. And you can't do 10 things well. What makes us think we can do that? Sure. So let's do one thing and spend as long as it takes to crush it and become the best in the world at that. Only at that point can we start talking about adding something else. So, I mean, if I'm being honest in my early vision, I wasn't even thinking about another program. Mm -hmm. I was thinking about one organization, one program until death, okay. you know? Mm -hmm. And so right around six years into this, we got pretty good at it. Like we, God has blessed us. We're decent at raising funds, decent at casting the vision. We've systematized the whole thing. What used to take, you know, three people to do this job now takes like 0.25 people. We just had a lot of efficiencies. And so we started asking questions about, well, should we consider just to be responsible before the Lord, adding another program, i.e. eliminating another barrier and missions. And yeah, we didn't take that lightly. We talked about it at the board level for like a year and a half because we didn't want to rush into something foolishly and then cannibalize what God already had going with the first program. So what is the second program? Yeah, second program is called the Missions Course. Okay. So this is a six week course to teach Christians about God's heart for the nations. So five of six American churchgoers don't know what the Great Commission is. Mm. And that comes from a Barna study in 2017. So it's like, it's like what? Like you're say, saying that one in six American churchgoers knows what it is, five in six doesn't, like that's a barrier in missions. And that's one that's worth talking about and building a program around. And, and unlike student debt, which is like very micro, very zoomed in, very specific, there's really we think one decent way to take care of that, um, unless you try to do something like like the high school level to get people to not take out student debt or something, which probably should exist. Well, so, Dave Ramsey has like a high yeah, school curriculum that's totally, pushing hard. Totally, which we. By the love. way, if I sound like a Dave Ramsey fanboy, I'm not. I'm just he he talks a lot about this. He's he the does. It's his topic. Yeah. yeah, it's his. And I've listened to a lot of Dave Ramsey. He's helped a lot of people, which we're grateful yeah. for. Uh, but but this one with the missions course, it's like. There's a thousand ways to skin that cat. Uh -huh. Like, how are we going to do this? We spent a lot of time thinking through it. We could talk more about the missions course in a second, but yeah, ultimately uh, we we added the second program, and I feel like it was, I don't know, the, the right fit. So for it's us. a six week program wherein you teach people about the Great Commission. Mm -hmm. What does that look like? You go into local churches? Is it all online? The yeah, local church focused. So um, we've we looked at what else is out there and we saw courses that were a lot longer and they're supposed to be an introduction to missions. And we just don't think someone who doesn't care about missions and is a yeah. church goer is going to buy into something that's longer than six weeks. So right. six weeks is kind of the sweet spot for us. Yeah. We thought it would give us enough time to articulate the, the great commission and the way it's worked out. So our six lessons are number one, the thread. So it's looking from Genesis to revelation. Mm -hmm. Let's look at the thread of scripture that talks about redemption of all people, right? So we're looking at that. Uh, that's the first one. And lesson. by the way, in, in lesson one, we're really proud of, uh, we, yeah. we developed a, a statement for God's purpose, which is not a small thing. And like, we don't claim to have like the corner on this. It's been said a thousand different ways. But for someone who doesn't care about missions, we wanted, you know, not a 10 sentence statement about God's purpose, which those need to exist and those are helpful, but we wanted one short sentence that people could understand that could help frame the rest of the missions course. So and we- John Piper did that, right? Missions uh, exist it, because worship doesn't? Yeah. Totally, and, and, and he did it in a really big book as well. Yeah. But right. for us, it's like, what's one way that we can answer the question, what is God's purpose? And, and one sentence that people remember, and we came up with this, his glory praised through Jesus among the nations. Mm. God's purpose is his glory praised through Jesus among the nations. That's pretty good. It's as short as we could get yeah. it without taking something away that was critical. And so we, we kick off lesson one with that statement and repeat it throughout 
all the lessons. It's really the theme. It's, it's the, the theme, theme of the course. Okay. Yeah. Yep. So then lesson two, um, we look at the thread in lesson one, lesson two, we're saying, what do the apostles do with the great commission? So let's look at the book of Acts right. and see how do they plant churches? What's faithful mm-hmm. pl- church planting look like? So that's lesson two. Lesson three is history of missions. So we look at, I think about the last 1700 years. Is that right? Um, uh, last 300 Last 300 years. years yeah. Sorry. 1700s. Um, Invert it. Yes, yeah, yes. I knew the number was right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the last 300 years, we look at five different missionaries. Who are they? Um, yeah. Hudson Taylor, Adoniram Judson, William Carey, Amy Carmichael, and John Patton. Nice. That was for Brooks Buser. It's, it's John five. Payton. John but. Payton. Yeah. yeah. Right. <laughs> yep. So yeah. We, look, we look at their five lives. What did they do? What was faithfulness for them? What were some of the errors that they made? Things that we should avoid. Yeah. Um, we really study their lives and show that they're just normal people mm-hmm. who are faithful. Um, so yeah, that's lesson three. Lesson four is the unfinished task. So the task remaining is another way to say it. What is going on in missions today? What does the world look like? That's where we talk about there's 3.2 billion people who do not have access to the gospel are unreached. Yeah. Um, that's lesson four. Lesson five is church planning. So we ask a couple or somebody who has actually planted a church among an unreached people group to teach this lesson. And they're going to just tell their story and show the proclamational model for them, faithfulness to scripture in the way that they planted a church. Are these videos? Are they books? What? Yep. So I'll get there in just a second. So lesson five, lesson six is your role. So okay. what's your how are you going to do do this in your life? Are you going to be a goer? Are you going to be a sender? Uh-huh. Send by praying, send by giving, things like that. We have videos. So we have a virtual model. So this can be done in small groups. This can be done corporately where, you know, a bunch of church people get together and then watch it on a screen. Yeah. So that's an option. Obviously, we... Kind of like Christianity Explored, but for missions. Uh, yeah. 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 I haven't actually thought about that, but yeah. Um, and then we also have a live version. We think this is the best option, uh, of course, to have somebody speaking in front of a group is wonderful. And so we offer that to churches and we take care of all the logistics. We actually fly the speakers out to the church and do six lessons with them, um, over six weeks. And is the, who wrote the curriculum? Uh, A combination of people. So the folks that we originally asked to do each video lesson, they wrote the first draft of the manuscript. And then every speaker that we have approved, they they provide a manuscript based on the outline that we give them um, to hit the learning modules that we want to accomplish. Yeah. And we vet that. It's, it's kind of like CHBC, Capitol Hill Baptist Church. They put out their Sunday school curriculum. Totally. And you can take it and tweak it, uh, but it's just meant to be a, a pretty yeah. thorough outline that you can kind of add yeah. your own mm-hmm. voice to. Yep. Yeah. Dude, I've got to tell them about, about Iowa. Oh, yeah. Yeah, of course. Yeah, this is crazy. So I've heard of it. You, uh, of state? state, yeah. I, I hadn't until like a, a lot year of ago. a lot of Californians okay. hadn't. It's like California, Texas, New York, and then like I'm all, from California. I totally get it. Yeah, when yeah, I moved to Alabama, it. I thought people were still going to be riding on tractors, and you know, <laughs> they're not. They're not. Well, I guess they still <laughs> some of them do. In fact, yes. Yeah. But I think they have tractors in California, from what I found out. A lot of tractors. Lot of yeah. yeah. Okay, but so, what happened in Iowa? This is crazy. So right around the time we we're considering adding another program, we're thinking about you know launching what ended up becoming the missions course, man, I don't know how to say this any other way, but like, we're not jealous in missions. Like Mm -hmm. we are not competitive. We're not looking to get the credit. It was, I think it was Harry Truman who had on his desk, a little placard that said something like it's a, I dropped the bomb. No. Okay. (laughs) No, sorry. What did he say? There it is. And you just dropped the bomb. (laughs) So he had a placard that said, it's astonishing how much you can accomplish if you don't care who gets the credit. Yeah, that's right. And we so resonate with that at Arrow. Like we don't care. Like we're not in this for the attention. If we wanted attention, we for sure would have done something else. If we want to make a lot of money, we for sure would have done something else. Like mm-hmm. that's not it for us. Mm-hmm. This is about eternal treasure, eternal rewards, mm-hmm. doing something with our life that counts, et cetera. We're like, okay, with that mindset, we don't have to do this. And so we actually started going to some friends in our network and said, what do you think about doing this? What do you think about doing this? And a couple of people were like, yeah, it's a good idea. Not a good time, not for us, et cetera. So we resolved to do it ourselves. We're like, fine, we'll do it. We don't even think we're the most qualified and not by a long shot, but we started the process. And then by God's grace, like probably within a couple of weeks or months before we would have started writing material from scratch, we heard about a couple of pastors in central Iowa and they had put on a course kind of like this. And we're like central Iowa. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't even know a single city in central Iowa. I call this guy, this guy's name is Barry Brown and another pastor, Greg Altmeyer. 
two pastors, different churches, uh, same region. And a few years ago, at that point, they had developed a course for their congregants to teach them about missions. They, they saw what was in the market, so to speak, and weren't impressed, and so came up with their own stuff. Yeah. And it was working. Like, Barry's church had an older demographic who was wealthier. Greg's church had a much younger demographic who was not wealthy. And so these churches started going through the courses independently, but obviously the pastors know each other. And, and people are like, yep, I'm in, let's do it. Greg gets a bunch of people from his church that want to go overseas long-term. Barry gets a bunch of people from his church that want to fund missions. One church to this day is funding a large majority of the other church's missions budget. Wow. It's like, that doesn't happen. And that tells me that the course was working. Mm -hmm. There's something about what they're talking about that's awakening people's hearts in such a way that this is not from man, this must be of God and the Holy Spirit. And so other people heard about this too, other pastors. And so they started calling them and they're like, Hey, we heard about your course at the time. It was called the journey course. We heard about the journey course. We want to do it at our church too. Could we use your material? And they're like, well, yeah, that's not why we like launched the material it was for us, but sure you can have it. That's fine. You know, you don't have to pay us for it. And they gave it to them. They got dozens of churches that were asking them for this and they realized we're, we're in a little bit over our heads. Like we, we didn't set out to start a nonprofit, we're pastors, right? And so they had a little bit of a, a quandary that we thought we could help solve. And so we flew them out to California for two days, talked with them and basically said, hey, we have a problem and you have a problem. And both of those problems could be solved by us buying the journey course from you. Mm -hmm. Like you don't talk a lot about acquisitions in the nonprofit space, but I think they should exist more often when there's a good fit. Mm. And for us, it was perfect, except they said to us, you can't buy it, we'll just give it to you. <laughs> and, and ironically, we did end up buying it. Uh, uh, I think their lawyer, their counsel said, uh, they, they have to have a transaction in place. Uh, if you have it, we pay two bucks. Two dollars. Yeah, one for each. Frames, you know. Inflation, am I right? You know, yeah, 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 right. yeah, right. Very expensive. And so, yeah, we bought the journey course from them. Uh, we're, we're great friends with both of them to this day and said, uh, thank you for giving us your baby. We will do our best to steward it. And so we, didn't honestly tweak that much. We tweaked some of it. Uh, we built a brand around it, mm -hmm. used whatever influence or platform God gave us to take it to pastors because we're not a local church, we're a parachurch. And so we're geared to do this sort of thing. And so it was a better fit for this stage for us to have it instead of them. And, and I think that speaks very much, not, not just for us, but for them especially, about the non-jealous, non-competitive, collaborative approach in missions that I think the missions world needs more of. So Arrow is kind of like meta. A little bit, yeah. You have the two, the two ministries underneath it. One is the yeah. GoFund and the other is called the Missions Course. That's right. Which, by the way, who, who's coming up with these names? They're amazing. Uh, minus the arrow. No, I'm just kidding. The arrow too. I'm just worried that people yeah. are going to go to Google it and they're never going to get there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What well, does arrow mean? Yeah. Arrow is actually a Greek word uh, that means to remove or to lift off. Mm. And so you see it uh, when Jesus is healing the paralytic. He says to him, uh, take up your mat, stand up and walk or arrow, stand up and walk. Mm. And so he's, he's saying to that man, effectively remove your burden or, or I will remove your burden for you. And so for us, we're like, that is so meaningful, yeah. right? That's literally what we're doing. We're removing barriers. One of them being student debt for a missionary. One of them being what you could call maybe the missionless churchgoer. Mm. And so that, that name and that meaning really resonates with us. And another meaning that we don't really talk about publicly mm -hmm. a ton uh, that first event I was telling you about. So back in 2015, mm -hmm. first fundraising dinner, three missionaries on stage, raised 90,000 bucks. And we had a, a speaker at that event, uh, Claude Hickman. God used this man, I believe, to open up the hearts and ultimately the wallets of people in the audience. It wasn't me, that's for sure. I, I was very sloppy as a speaker at that point. Uh, pr probably hey, still. you still are. Thank you. <laughs> That's friendship. That's friendship. If you weren't going to say it. Yeah, he was. I would have I had it. Honestly, you guys are both great and you're a good pair. 
I really see thanks. why the Lord put you together. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, we're grateful. Yeah. Yeah, yeah opposites attract, man. Yeah, yeah, we probably wouldn't have picked it way back then, but God, God knew better than we did, and, and we're grateful. So, so anyways, <clears throat> God used this guy. Yeah, we're at this event, 190 people there. I'm sweating. I have no idea what to do. Literally, we have guests outside in the lobby waiting for the doors to open. I'm sitting inside at table number one with my hands crouched, just waiting. Like, I was like... How old was I? 25? I had no idea what to do, right? I'd never done this before. So they come in, they sit down. I do my little thing. It was all right. And then Claude Hickman gets on stage and he gives probably the best 20 minute talk I think I've ever heard about missions. Mm. And it was so remarkably simple, yet biblically profound. He said, every missionary is an arrow, but what I'm going to cry just thinking about it. He said, what good is an arrow without a bow? Mm. He said, everyone in this audience could be a bow. And you have three arrows that you just saw on stage. And who's going to help them get to the field? Mm -hmm. And man, like the checkbooks just came out. Mm. People are like, yes. Like in the least transactional way possible, the most missional way possible, I'm going to write a check for this. I actually had a guy that night. Uh, man, this is gonna be a tough one to get through too. This is a guy that um, my wife had known like her whole life, kind of a family friend. I met him, barely knew the guy. And we had these pledge cards and just asked people, you know, how, how much are you gonna commit and for how long, pretty, pretty standard. And I, I now know a bit of the backstory. This guy knew nothing about missions. I mean, not a lick. Grew up in the church and churches didn't talk about missions or he didn't hear it or whatever. And this guy, uh, checks the box to give a monthly amount. And then there were options. There was options for like, for one year, for two years, for three years, whatever. So he lists his monthly amount, creates a new box, checks the box, and next to the box writes, keep going. Mm. Fast forward about 10 years, and today that guy's our board chairman. Wow. And so to watch this transformation that began in his heart and other people's hearts, even in my heart, that evening, uh, we think was perfectly captured by naming the organization Arrow, which not only means to remove, yeah. but it's also a homonym for Arrow, the metaphor that Claude used uh, that uh, that day to talk about missionaries getting to the field. Which is why we don't use the proper pronunciation of the Greek word, which would be Iro for all of you Greek uh -huh. scholars. Uh -huh. yeah. I know you were thinking it, Sean. Cosmos, uh, Cosmos. Yeah, whatever. same, same. So we call it Arrow yeah. for that reason. So do you like the name more I now? I take it all back. <laughs> I love it. Don't change it. And, you know, change is hard for people. You know, yeah. GoFund. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Arrow, I like it too, though. Yeah, yeah. thanks. All right, we want them. Yeah, I think just, just one thing, like the emotion that Luke expressed, I think it comes from this. And this is something we've really grown into. Like in the church today, especially if you're at a mobilized church, a church is talking about the nations there seems to be like two types of people, like the Christians who are faithful and are, you know, the A plus Christians and they go overseas and there's everybody else. Right. Yeah. They're the special ops. Yes. The Green Beret Christians. Yeah. Yep. And obviously like we're missions work. We care deeply about missionaries. Mm -hmm. We wish, you know, thousands more would go. But for us, we felt like God was calling us to something different, but we always felt like second class. And so for him to paint that picture at that event oh, that man. was so significant to show people that they had a significant role in the Great Commission, they just needed to take hold of the bow and do something. Yeah. And that meant something for us. And it's like it framed the way we've lived our lives for the last you know 10 years. Yeah. I've literally had people to this day, like as of just last year in 2023, come up to me and say, hey, that arrow bow thing, I still think about that yeah. to this day. Yeah, it's kind of like the uh, the well metaphor. Have you heard that? Some people mm. go down into the well. Some people hold the rope for those who do. Oh, yeah. And in some ways, the rope holders yeah. give more. You know, I mean, yeah. it, 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 it's hard. It's it's a strain to hold that rope while people go down. That's right. Either way, we're all involved in well activity. You know, mm -hmm. we're, we're all in on this together. Yeah. Everyone is not a missionary, That's right. right? Because missionaries are missionaries but everyone is in on missions. That's right. Yeah, they, That's right. they must be. If they're not, they're in disobedience. Have you heard the rope holder story, like where that came from? No. Man, it was in the 1700s. Uh, there's this Baptist pastor and he starts to learn about lost people in India. And he learns there's something like 23 languages in India that don't have a Bible in their language. 
And he's just undone by this, totally blown away. How can people not have the Bible in their language? Not okay with this. So remember, he's a Baptist minister in London. It is a six month and 10 day journey from London to India by boat, right? Like you can't just hop on an American flight or a United flight or whatever to fly to a place like this, right? Like you you gotta get on a boat. And so what he does is he gets behind his pulpit on a Sunday soon after that. And he stands up and he looks at the congregation and basically says, uh, these people are lost in India. And it's like to reach them would be like going down an abandoned mine. And I will go into that mine if you will hold the rope. Mm. And that day there's another man in the audience named Andrew Fuller. Andrew Fuller stands up, he looks at William Carey and he says, I'll hold the rope as long as I live. Mm. And so fast forward, William Carey goes to India and uh, Andrew Fuller, man, he spends the next couple of decades of his life being a rope holder for William Carey. Wow. He's raising money. He's telling people about his work. He's writing letters and effectively starts the first mission agency that we know of. Mm. And for the rest of his life, that's what he does. And he, he said at one point, um, he says, um, Lord, use my influence and my affluence to be a rope holder for William Carey. Yeah. And after, I think it was 40 years in India, William Carey translates the Bible into the language of 300 million people. But the point of the story is there is no Carey without a fuller. Amen. There's no goer without a sender and there's no missionary without a rope holder. Yeah. So if we think that the missionary is more valuable than the sender, we need to understand this reality that the the spark that starts every story in missions is the sender, mm. right? Kerry had to, or, uh, Fuller had to stand up at some point and say, I will hold the rope. Like that was a spark. Cause without that, Kerry doesn't go. That never happens. And, and you see this backed up biblically, right? In, in Romans chapter 10, you see this, right? Um, Paul, the apostle, he kind of reverse engineers how unreached people get reached, right? How will they call on him and whom they've never heard? They won't. How are they to hear without someone preaching? They won't. How are they to preach unless they're sent? They won't, right? They're not going to, they're not going to get sent. So Paul even shows us like, that's the spark right there. The spark that starts this chain, this sequence of events to reach an unreached people, unreached person is the sender. The sender sends the person who goes, so they might call on the Lord and believe in his name for the very first time. And that's exactly what happens here and why this rope holder metaphor is so rich for us, because that's what we get to do. And we hope that one day, you know, so to speak, man, we get to show up to heaven and the first thing we will do is fall down and worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and see the scars in his hands. But I hope maybe in uh, the Lord's kindness, we'll be able to open up our hands too and say like, we have like burns on our hands from holding the rope. Like this is what we got to do for you. And, and then we lay our crowns down and we worship him for all of eternity. But like, that's what we get to do. The God who has everything and needs nothing gives us everything so that we can participate. Mm. It's, like, what a privilege. It's unbelievable. This reminds me of a book. Uh, there's a pastor in Chicago, Will Pareja. I want to say it with a Spanish accent. Pareja. I think he's Cuban. He recommended a book to me this year called Gospel Patrons. Oh, yeah. John, John Reinhardt. He's okay. a friend. Good guy. Uh, what a fantastic little book. I oh, sent yeah. it immediately to some guys who I know are doing well. The Lord has given them much. And I know their heart for the Great Commission, their heart for the gospel. And I said, just read this or listen to the audio book and let it be an encouragement to you because... Gospel pa patrons are huge. Without gospel patrons, there's no John Calvin. There's no William Carey. There's no, there's no you guys mm -hmm. uh, doing the work that you're doing. Yeah, in that book, uh, I think he talks about William Tyndale, mm -hmm. and that's a name most people know, right? Did, yeah. did a translation uh, to, into English, but no one knows the guy behind him. I think yeah. it was uh, Humphrey Monmouth. Yeah, it's like. When's the last time you heard someone talk about him? Oh yeah, and they're not gonna remember your, his name after you say it just now. No, of course know? not. Yeah, Right, but Tyndale, you've heard a billion times, uh -huh. so it sticks. But yeah, Humphrey Monmouth opens up his his home and lets uh, illegally lets William Tyndale mm -hmm. translate the Bible and then uses his merchant ships to mm -hmm. transport these Bible translations uh, all across Europe. And I think ultimately goes to jail for that. It's crazy. Because you guys are in the position you're in, you're probably aware of how many like secret agents of heaven there are who just 
love to write checks. They're just out there yep. getting after it. Nobody knows their name. They most of the time they say, please don't tell anybody that I'm, mm-hmm. you know, not not for bad reasons, for good reasons. You know, yep. don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. But they're just out there moving, shaking, using their influence, using their resources for the sake of the Great Commission. Praise God for brothers and sisters like that. We're gonna be telling their stories in heaven. Yeah. Like, Amen. It's, it's wonderful. I think about that with my friends who are well off. Like I used to be afraid of them making money. <clears throat> No. I think you understand what I mean by that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But now I tell them like, make as much Do more, money go as harder. you possibly yes. can. But like, give it away for the sake of things yeah. that it will last forever. Yeah. Like, and when they understand that this stuff is all going to burn, yeah. man, they could change the world because mm-hmm. they can make money. It's yeah. wonderful. And even you think about someone like Warren Buffett, you know, mm-hmm. he's, uh, Charlie Munger just died, his, right. his lifetime partner. Right. Uh, and Buffett has a plan to give the vast majority of his wealth away to, um, you know, charitable causes when he dies. So mm-hmm. everybody's doing this. Yeah. Everyone who yeah. is saving up for the day that they die, when they die, they're making plans for where that money's going to go. Well, if you're a Christian, you better be having good gospel plans for that money and give, give away as much of it uh, while, while you're here to like, I, I'm, I'm worried about people who save up a lot of money and then have gospel plans for it after they die. Because mm-hmm. it's like, you don't know that that money is going to be spent the way that That's you right. think it's going to be spent. Like, for example, uh, I don't think it's a good idea to leave a lot of money behind when you die to, to make sure that like this church survives, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. right? Like this is my church. I love this church. I, I'm going to write into my will. I have $3 million in my savings account. I want it to go to this church. Well, what if in two generations that church lo- loses the gospel, right? You can't be in control of how that money is being used after you That's die. Right. But while you're alive, you can take that same $3 million and use it in ways uh, that you, by God's grace, have some level of discernment over. And I don't know how this one works. This is for sure a third tier issue, but I've heard some fairly compelling arguments uh, that would say that uh, money given posthumously or after death uh, doesn't um, no bring rewards eternal rewards for you. It's like, you, you didn't have the faith to give it I've while you're alive. That, yeah. Like I, I never thought about it until yeah, I heard yeah, someone else say, yeah. I, I don't know if I have a stance on it, but it's really interesting to think about like yeah. lay up there for yourselves treasures in heaven. Is it, yeah, parentheses before you die, but before you leave, I don't know. I don't know. Like it's not No, the, the reasoning clear. tracks. Yeah. Or there's something there. There's something about the faith that it takes to give it. Yes. That it, yes. you might be holding onto that money because maybe you're not trusting the Lord. You think you need it. But then like once you're dead, you're like, ah, I'm not going to need that anymore. That's right. Yeah. Yes. There's something there. Yeah. I, I've been really encouraged by how even when people are not seeking to be generous with their money, God is kind enough for those who are willing to accept his correction, his direction, uh, to, to show them, here's what I want you to do. Yeah. I think of an example of, I think it'd be fine with me sharing this without their names, but we have some friends who've been given to the organization since the beginning. And it was right around that same early stage era. Our second missionary partner, man, <clears throat> this, this family, they similar situation to the first one, same story every time. Want to go overseas, we built our whole lives, your last few years around this, and we can't because of student debt. So we approved them. Uh, at the time, we didn't know this, but they were living with a family and the family was letting them live there because they had a big house and they're trying to save up money to go overseas and pay off their student debt and all this. And they knew they had a student debt issue. So they come home one day and they're like, hey, we found this organization that's going to pay our student debt. And they're like, this is a pretty shrewd business guy. He's like, right. I think that's a scam. If it's too good to be true, if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. Exactly. And so they want to meet with me. And so they're like, no, we're, we're telling you it's not a scam. Like, he's like, yeah, yeah, I still want to meet with a guy. Yeah. So he's- Wait, do you watch The Office? Uh, like every episode. It's kind of like <laughs> Michael Scott talking about how it's not a pyramid scheme. <laughs> yeah, he drops it. <laughs> comes up, yeah. <laughs> it's totally legit. Yeah, pyramid. Yeah, yeah he could have done that on a napkin at yeah. uh, lunch. So this guy comes to lunch with me. He brings his wife and I can tell like he's defensive. He's, oh, yeah. he's trying to suss me out. Mm-hmm. He's like, this guy's trying to swindle. He's trying to get bank account numbers or something from the, the sweet family living in our house who has four kids. And I tell him about what we're doing. I'm like, listen, like this is going to sound super weird. I know it doesn't make sense, but this is what God's telling me to do. And we pick this family because they're perfect. They're going long-term to the unreached and through their local church. And we just want to help them get there sooner. And man, they look at me and they, they start to cry. 
And they literally pull out a checkbook and start to write me a check on the spot. I'm like, hey, I ain't here to ask for money. Mm -hmm. And he's like, no, you don't understand. He's like, we have spent our whole lives buying things and building a comfortable life for ourselves and we've done really well. Mm -hmm. He's like, but in the last year, I've had three people come to me separately. He's like, I'm not like a, like a charismatic guy or whatever. I don't have people prophesy over me all the time, but these three people all told me if we didn't start to give our money to missions that God was gonna take my life. He's like, man, Jeez. we have to give to this thing. We have to. And over the last eight or nine years, they've been one of our top donors and like, man. Yeah, he's still alive. Still here, he's still alive, <laughs> still giving. You know, that reminds me of uh, Calvin. Who is the guy who basically threatened Calvin? He was like, if you don't go back to Geneva, God's gonna get you. And Calvin was like, huh? Farrell, that's right. And Calvin was like, all right, I'll, I guess I'm going back. Yes, I'm going. You know? It's like, that's God's yeah. kindness, right? To, to direct people, even when they're not looking for it. And to his credit and to her credit, they obeyed and they obeyed in a, in a big way. And it, it, the relationship has just been rich. Like they're some of our best friends. We go on vacation with them. Wow. It's not a transactional thing like, oh, you owe us money or this thing's going to yeah. happen. It's like, no, dude, this is between you and the Lord. Yeah. And if he provides and he directs you to give, you know what we're going to do with the money. Amen. You're good at making money and we're good at building processes for missions. And you put us together and we can do great things for the kingdom by God's grace. <laughs> like a key said, man, the God who has everything, like, and us, we have nothing. He gives us everything so that we can participate. And that's exactly what he did here. You were gonna say something, Matt? No. no. Okay. Well, brothers, I think we'll bring it to a close. Uh, if someone is listening to this and they think this is a ministry I wanna get behind, how would they do that? Yeah, go to aeromissions.com. So uh, like I mentioned- A-I-R-O. A-I-R-O missions.com. And on our website, you can learn about uh, the GoFund and the missions course. And I would say specifically for pastors, if there's a pastor listening, I would encourage these pastors highly to look at the missions course. We built the missions course as a service to and a tool for pastors. Who Busy been, pastors doing sermon prep yes, every week, probably can't develop yes. their own curriculum. Talking about you missions, ministering to people, you know, guy in the first row, second row, third row, all going through a life crisis. You don't have mm -hmm. time to develop a missions course. So we did it for you. And, and our goal was not to make it as expensive as possible, but as affordable as possible. And so let's talk and let's figure out a way to help get these into your church and, and just see what God will do. When people start talking about the fact that God is a missionary God, so we must be a missionary people. Incredible things happen in your church. I'm just warning you though, you might lose some of your best members to the mission field yeah. and that would be a glorious thing. Yes. And, and, and for the cause of Christ, I hope it happens and I hope we get to be a part of that. You know, we just did a, a missions course in our city and there's 125 young people who took the course at the end of the lesson. Luke actually taught lesson six. He said, if you're considering going long-term, uh, would you stand up? And 25 people stood up, said for the first time, I'm considering this. Like, that's wonderful. Like a yeah. healthy church sense. That's what they do. Wow. That's all through scripture. And that's true today. And so we want to just be a small part in serving in that way yeah. to help lo local pastors send their people. All right, guys, let me pray for you. Please. Thanks. Lord, thank you for Luke and Matt. Thank you for, first of all, loving them before the foundations of the world, calling them to yourself irrevocably, uh, uh, shedding the blood of your son to save them, sealing them with the promise of your Holy Spirit, guaranteeing uh, their arrival in glory. Lord, help them to remain firm, steadfast, rooted in the truth of the gospel. Do not let them in any way be blown about by the, the winds and the waves that may come crashing down on them in the days, weeks, months, years ahead. Uh, protect them, keep them, and continue to use them. We pray that you'll bless Arrow Ministries for the glory of your name. Lord, there is uh, no limit. There, there are a thousand different ways, 10,000, a million different ways we can be creative for the cause of the Great Commission. Uh, and you have equipped the body with so many different members, with so many different gifts. Uh, here we have a ministry that has been born of that. Your Holy Spirit has worked uh, in Aero to, to bring it about so that uh, your name might be glorified among the nations. So yeah, we have great hope for what's going to happen here. And we, we, we rejoice for the day when we are all in heaven together, looking back on the way that you use this, not for us, not for us, but to your name be the glory. We pray this in the mighty, beautiful, glorious, powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Amen.
let me record my immovable conviction that this is the noblest service in which any human being can spend or be spent. And that, if God gave me back my life to be lived over again, I would, without one quiver of hesitation, lay it on the altar to Christ, that he might use it as before in similar ministries of love, especially amongst those who have never yet heard the name of Jesus. At Ten of Those, we want to serve the local church by equipping your church family with great resources that are going to point them to Jesus. So we'll come and set up a pop-up bookstore in your church. There's no charge. We'll come for your Sunday services. Maybe you've got a, a weekend retreat or a conference. We would love to come and then make recommendations. This is one I've read three times now. It's called Incomparable by Andrew Wilson. And he goes through 60 characteristics of God. It just wonderfully takes our eyes off, off the world, off ourselves, and puts them on our Saviour. Now we've got lots of things for families and, uh, and kids. For parents, I want to recommend this series. This one is Raising Kids in a Screen-Saturated World. Our passion is to get good books that hold the Bible read by as many people as possible. We handpick our bookstore, it's curated, so we know everything we sell will point to the Lord Jesus. Everything's discounted. And as we make recommendations, we're seeking to serve your church family so that they may be excited and equipped to read good books. And as they do, we'll be praying that it might just change their life.